Okay. Um, so today I'm presenting this paper, which came out about a month ago, called Efficient Streaming Language Models with Attention Sinks. Um, from the format of the paper, I can tell that it was probably submitted to ICLR. And this is like the archive preprint of that paper. Um, the paper is trying to address a very specific problem, but also one that's pervasive now that uh, large language models have become such an important part of industry, uh, which is which is um, trying to be able to generate and stream the uh, the inputs of the outputs of generation quickly. So you can imagine that um, that probably OpenAI might get like thousands or millions of requests for generation. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Damien. Uh, uh, we might have, uh, have some problems with audio. OK. Not quite sure. Um, OK. Uh, let's keep going. And if the auto is cutting in and out, or if it starts being more than one person, then we'll then we'll. Um... Okay, I can hear you fine, Peter. Okay, You're fine. So you can you can imagine that uh, OpenAI probably gets like thousands, or probably even tens of thousands, of requests per second for GPT four and uh, Chat GPT, which means that they have to on a second by second basis, generate massive amounts of text and stream it to the, their users. Um, especially uh, given that they have to, these models have to deal with like really long input texts often. This is difficult because like the, the speed at which you can um, perform a forward pass through a large language model, which is a transformer model is uh, quadratically it's 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 quadratically proportional to the length of the sequence that you're inputting. So, like, if you want to input a really large sequence and output uh, a token, and you you want to jet, and if you want to generate a really large sequence from that, it can take a really long time. So, this paper tries to it it's a it's a it's a suggests a method to to really quickly generate and stream text, but what it's really doing is um because we have methods that do that that are able to like speed up the generation of text quite a bit but it's what it's really doing is proposing a method which can do that and uh produce high quality results or at least that's what the experiment suggests um i think there's a a figure that i wanted to start off with which demonstrates like um how different methods compare so uh, to be able to read this figure, you should know that the, the value that's being used to measure performance throughout the paper is perplexity. Um, I, I, the last time I looked up perplexity, I don't remember what it is, but it's kind of a measure of like how, how similar two, two texts are. I think that's a good de description of it. But essentially, um, higher means worse with perplexity. And um, oh wow, I, I wonder why. So the, there's many different types of attention. The standard type, of, or for for generation, the standard type of attention is this one here called dense attention, which is um, when you attend to all of the tokens previous to the token that you're um, want to generate, like the next token from, and that is um, both very slow. Um, and it has see it says it has like t squared performance on text, so that means that like based on the sequence length, it takes t squared amount of time, uh, and then it has a very high perplexity. Uh, <clears throat> this is this is because uh, the the I think it has to do with um, how long the context window was during training. So uh, for for this example, the context window is I think four four blocks. So here, when the model sees a lot more blocks than it was trained on, it really struggles. Um, 
So then what you can do instead is use something called window attention, which uh, is much faster. It's um, the sequence length times the window length, essentially, is the, the speed at which it, it calculates the next token, but the perplexity is still very high. And so what they suggest, uh, an, another method which has good performance but is still pretty computationally intensive is you actually do this sliding window, like the window attention sliding window, but with recomputation. So you have to recompute the key and values for the last, uh, for all of the tokens within your window. That's why it's L squared. Um, Cause it's the, the computation for just one token would be T times L, but then you have to do it for all of the L tokens in your window. And so it's TL squared, but that has good perplexity. Um, so that's pretty good, except it's slow. And what they found is they can do something which they're calling streaming attention. By, and what it is is that they've recognized that there's this thing called an attention sink within a model. And um, by doing streaming uh, attention or this LLM attention, you get both a very quick generation process. It's only T times L, um, where L is much smaller than T because it's just your window length. And then you get also a very good perplexity. So the model is saying like, okay, we're going to propose a method that has both the like fastest is both the fastest at generation, but also provides equivalent performance to much slower methods. That's what this is about. Um, and the, the, the key insight of this paper is that, um, I'll say for now, but I'm hoping to give you guys an explanation later. For some strange reason, it's really important that the model always has access to the first couple tokens in the sequence. Um, they, they have a, uh, well, um, before I go to that, so a really key operation within a transformer is um, attention, and it's what how you, it's self it's self attention, sorry, and that's when you recalculate the representation of each element within your sequence by attending to that element, but also all the other elements in the sequence. Um, that's the most basic form of attention, and. Uh, in order for the attention mechanism to work correctly, they found that um, they that the model needs to have access to the first couple tokens in the sync sequence. And the reason is because they act as what they call attention sinks. And just to show you what that looks like, um, I'm just, gonna make this okay. just to show you what that looks like, so red uh, over here, oh, so, but remember how before I said that for attention, you always look at the um, all the elements in the sequence. Well, that's not true uh, during generation because you can't look forward. But also during training, uh, these models perform causal masking, so you only see the tokens that are before you in the sequence, and that's why this is a lower triangular matrix. Um, but so red here means a really high attention weight, basically meaning that the model is paying a lot of attention to that element. Um, and so if we go down to like the eighth row, what you can see is that the model is paying attention to the element that it's performing the query for, so element eight, but also a couple of the tokens before it as well. Um, and then if you go to the next row, kind of similar, but less so, so like you're seeing less attention, um, but by the time you get to the second row, almost the, the vast majority of the attention is on the um, first token. And then that's uh, uh, true throughout the next couple of layers, like throughout the rest of it. So basically what's happening, which is really interesting, is that the model is after the first couple of layers, essentially not really performing attention. It's putting the vast majority, or maybe I wouldn't say it's not performing attention, putting the vast majority of its um, attention on the first token in the sequence. Um, I'll try to come up to, I, I'm hoping to give you a bit of an explanation why later, but 
just that observation can show you why this uh, sliding window method performs so poorly. Um, because after the first token, you stop having access to the first, after, the, after generating like the first four tokens, you don't have access to the that uh, those elements in the sequence. So like you stop, you, you lose access to this, uh, these tokens in the beginning of the sequence, which are attention sinks, which are super important for the model's performance. Um, and so th th this is like the key insight and uh, observation of this paper, which motivates the whole method that the model for some reason needs access to this first token. And actually it's the first four tokens based on some empirical experiments that they did. Now, there's uh, two explanations that they give for why these first couple of tokens might be so important for the model per to perform good uh, uh, good inference. The, the first is that these tokens are always semantically meaningful. And the second one is that they're what they call an attention sink, which I'll try to explain in a second. And just to, to, to um, debunk the first hypothesis or to provide evidence against the first set, the first hypothesis, they, there's a, there's a table that shows, sorry, give me a second. Okay, there's a table that shows um, that that's not the case. So what they do is they, they on some data set, they perform window, window detention and calculate the perplexity on a test set. And you can see without including the first four tokens, so that's what zero plus 124, 10, uh, 1024 means, you get a perplexity that's in the order of 5,000. If you include the first four tokens, then you get a perplexity that's on the order of five. I mean, like, you get what I mean. Um, and then what they do instead is they take the first four tokens and they replace them with a next line character, a slash n. So they're completely replacing them and you get the same perplexity. Just shows that like, it's not the semantic importance of those first four tokens that's leading to this increase in performance when you include them. It's just that they're there and that you're including them. So what it means then is that the model is treating those first four tokens uh, a lot differently than um, any of the other tokens in the sequence. And the way that they're treating them is what they call an, an attention sink. Um, so let's talk about what an attention sink is. I know I've said it quite a few times. Uh, so at a, in its most basic form, attention sink is, is a, a token that is given a really high attention value. So like the weight of that token is given, it is much higher than the rest of the tokens in the sequence. And so you can see that from layer two onwards, the first token in this example is an attention sink. Um, so I wanted to, at this point, take a step back and look at how attention weights are calculated in the hopes of giving you guys a bit of an idea of what it means to be an attention sink from a mathematical point of view. So I, I made a really simple diagram. So dot product attention um, is so so transformers use what's called dot product attention and dot product attention it com it's composed of uh, two operations in sequence the first operation is when you have a query vector which is like one of the elements in the sequence so like uh, in over here if we were looking at the eighth row the query vector would be the embedding vector of the eighth token. And then you have all of the other tokens in the sequence that you want to compare to. And for each of them, so you calculate the dot product uh, divided by the square root of the dimensionality of the vectors. Let's not get into that. I just put that there for completeness. But uh, you calculate the dot product between those two um, vectors which is equal to like the magnitude of vector A times the magnitude of vector B uh, times the, the, the cosine of the angle between them. So for these like two, um, in two dimensions, if you had two vectors that were like these two red arrows, theta would be the, the, the angle between them. And so if you have a, um, 
if the if the two vectors are pointing in the same direction, then they have a cosine theta value of one. If they're orthogonal to each other, if they're uh, perpendicular to each other, then they have a cosine value of zero. And if they're in the exact opposite direction, they have a cosine value of minus one. So the way that we judge how similar um, two, token, two tokens are, are by like the magnitude of the two tokens. But these, token, these embeddings are usually normalized in the previous layer. So we could kind of think of them of having a magnitude near one. Um, and then also the, uh, the, um, the angle between those two. So uh, what that means in terms of what these attention sinks are doing, which is really interesting, is that for all of the next tokens in the sequence, after and from layer for layer two onwards, the uh, embedding vector of all of these tokens has a much smaller angle um, with respect to the first token than they do to with respect to any of the other tokens, especially if you go like here, they're, the, they're still like it, the tension is still attending to the, the, the element beforehand. But after that, like in layer nine, you can see it's always just the first token that it's attending to. Um, when you look at this diagram, you say like, well, how is that possible? Uh, because wouldn't that mean that like for any token, all of the other uh, all of the other embedding vectors would be pointing in the same direction? But this is that's because this is a two D example. You have to think about the fact that the embedding vectors in these um, in in these transformers are like I think at, usually they're between a thousand and four thousand and even longer dimensions. So it's a lot easier to make uh, all the tokens in the in the sequence point close to like the first token and then not close, not be pointing in the same direction as each other. Um, but anyway, so that's what's going on under the hood. And then you just perform a softmax operation so that your attention weights uh, sum to one. Um, but yeah, so what this is doing uh, is for, for me, the way I think of attention sinks and what they're doing is they're essentially creating the equivalent of a, a skip connection that you see in a, um, you, you, you see like that was introduced with ResNet around a, a, a linear layer, just to show you guys what a skip connection is really quickly, I think. It's, this is a ResNet paper. So like here's a, I'll, I'll zoom in. Here's a, a really classic, uh, here, here's a, a diagram of a skip connection. So you have your linear layer, which is called your weight layer, and then you have your um, you have your uh, non-linearity, and then you have, a, well, here the, the skip connection is every two layers. But anyway, um, then you have another weight layer, and then you have your non-linearity, and you have a connection that skips all of that. And the justification that they give for, um, why they do this in the ResNet paper is that it either allows the model to completely ignore that layer, so the weights in that layer can learn to be zero, or make very small changes, which I'd argue is probably more likely what's happening with these attention things. But what, what an attention sink does is it means you're always looking at like a, essentially a constant vector for all of the tokens. Like the representation coming out of the attention block for all of the tokens uh, is going to be the same, which you can think of more as like adding a bias as opposed to like calculating a new representation. Um, and uh, so it's kind of like skipping that. It's, the, the, there's not no real attention is being performed because all of the attention is being placed on the same token for all of the the uh, embeddings, even though they're definitely different from each other. Because if they weren't, then you wouldn't be able to generate different tokens at the end for each element in your sequence. So that's like that's what's happening. That's the idea of an attention sink. I, I, I'm I'm adding on the idea that it's kind of like a skip connection. That's not in the paper. That's just kind of like my own interpretation of what's going on here. But I do find it super interesting. And um, uh, I so I've talked about the semantic. Well, they one thing they do to uh, test this hypothesis is 
so they find by, and let me see if I can find the results. I want to try to point to results whenever I talk about things. Um, okay, so they they find that uh, they they try to determine how many of the initial tokens act as token sinks over a, a, a wide range of like over a set of data sets. And so what they do is they say, okay, like let's make the context like twenty forty eight and use a no none of the initial tokens. And this is a perplexity for different models. Um, and then they add one, and they see that uh, this is the perplexity. It, it decreases drastically in some cases. And then adding up to four, you seem to see like an increase in performance, especially with Llama. Um, it's, it always goes down. But then when you add eight, it doesn't seem to matter that much. So they say, like, OK, our rule of thumb is you always add four tokens. But what they also do is they train a model, a language model, um, instead of with a, a special like attention sync token at the beginning, um, which they call a learnable sync, and um, you can see that it has just having that one token that's been trained to work as an attention sync increases a perplexity, like decreases the perplexity by two orders of magnitude, and you don't really need to add any more tokens. Um, so they. Yeah, they show that you can uh, just use um, learnable attention sync. They they interestingly also show that they 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 point out this thing that they're calling. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Where is that describing the thing? Okay, yeah, okay, I got it, I got it. Right. So they, um, instead of using a sync token, they also have this idea of using uh, softmax off by one, which is when you calculate softmax, but you add one to it. So you're adding a bias that like, I think decreases the value of all of the, the weights. And I think that's what zero sync is here, but maybe not, sorry. Uh, I read this paper like three days ago, so it's not. I uh, know. Sorry, zero sync is just the the conventional one where you're at. This is this is what they're proposing, not with a learnable sync token, because they have two methods that they propose. One is where you 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 uh, add in a a learnable sync token at, during pre training, so you don't need to keep track of all four tokens. And one is where you you don't. And so this is just like the the more easier method to implement that they're proposing. This is with the learnable sync. Um, but where's the method where they talk about this? Because they compare having attention sinks to just using this softmax operation instead. And that is, hmm. oh, I'll skip it somewhere. Sorry, give me one sec. I'm gonna have to look for it. Oh man, I'm sorry. I can't find the results now, but I'm pretty sure they're in there because I pretty, I think I saw them. Or maybe they're in the appendix or something like that. Oh, this paper doesn't have an appendix. I thought that was interesting too. Okay. Anyway, they say that instead of using uh, attention sinks, you can try using this uh, softmax off by one softmax to like uh, decrease the amount of attention used.
So yeah, that's the the tension sink method. Uh, sorry for the rambling at the end, but I hope I've given you guys a bit of an idea of what that is and um, like what an attention sink is and the two different methods they propose, which is one adding a learnable sink and one just including the first four tokens in all your window detention. One interesting um, observation, opinionated observation of mine about this method is that while it does solve the like uh, speed issue and has low perplexity. To me, um, this method doesn't address one of the issues that you have when you generate like really long uh, elements of text, which is uh, long dependencies. Um, because while you could argue that like each token in the um, in a in in a transformer summarizes all the tokens before it. I think that when you're using it in the manner that it's used here, where you're not attending to all of the previous tokens for each computation, um, you end up creating like a bottleneck, where the like uh, the in this case, like the fourth token back has to summarize four like five tokens itself and the other four behind it. So. Um, in the case where you have like very long-term dependencies between texts, like for example, you have some fact that's relevant that's at the first chapter in a book to the last chapter in a book, and you need to use that to generate something. That this, in my opinion, this paper doesn't really address that problem, but that's a really hard problem to address where you have to start thinking, I think more about like, how do I effectively summarize very large amounts of text in, uh, in a, like a vector or a small set of vectors. Um, but it does address the issue of speed and also it has very good performance. Um, all, of the, all of the results are basically uh, evaluating a, attention sinks like this method on different problems. So if we go through it quickly, um, it says language modeling and long text across LLM and LLM families and scales. Um, now this is just showing you that uh, performance increases as you increase the size of the model. Uh, this is showing you that the performance is the same pretty much. Yeah, I'm not really going to go through that. Uh, oh yeah, here here is comparing the performance on um, different types of attention. This is just showing that it perform it's much quicker and that it's. Um, has good performance. I'm speeding the, through these things because they're basically saying what I've talked about before, just with concrete data sets. Um, so yeah, that's the paper. Uh, I didn't go through the results too much because they're, they're pretty much like, this is, this is confirming what we were talking about in the method. But it's showing that attention sinks are like, uh, a behavior within uh, transformers and like these large language models and that we need to take them into account if we want to perform like fast and efficient streaming of or generating a generation of text. Um, so yeah, that's the paper. I thought it was super interesting. And I really like that they kind of dug deep into how the model is performing within the layers of the model because that's an analysis. I don't see that often in papers often because it's not warranted, but like it's not something I see that often. And, I, and they found something very, like a very uh, obvious and useful relationship by delving into like the attention weights within the model. Um, and what's cool about it is that in theory, it can it can have, like they say here, you can, you can generate like an unlimited amount of text because you're using a fixed amount of memory uh, every time you generate a new token. So it doesn't increase with, sequence length or it increases marginally based on um, like the fact that you have to take in, you have to save a larger and larger string, but that's nothing compared to how much 
uh, memory is required for uh, like performing a forward pass through a transformer. So yeah, it's a really cool paper, and I could see it. I could totally see it being something that we start using a lot. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see, because perplexity isn't the greatest measure of performance. I'd say that mainly because we're moving away from like using these types of metrics to measure text, uh, per, like performance in generating text. It will be interesting to see when this can get evaluated by some like more semantically, like some some metric that measures semantics, and to see if it if the performance is still really good. But uh, does anyone have any questions or anything they want to talk about here? Yeah, I've got a quick question. Mm -hmm. So uh, from this paper, it's, it's, their findings are a bit counterintuitive because I would imagine as you progress across the text, your, your semantic meaning is evolving. Mm -hmm. it, just does, it just doesn't make sense. How, how, can, how can your, um, your current snapshot, your instantaneous uh, key, key v, uh, KV pair, as in, uh, let's say, <clears throat> the sentence started off with the news, on something, I don't know, topic X, and now you're slowly shifting and referencing other topics. If if there's no semantic relationship between my new topic and my old one, I just don't understand how could that old uh, key, KV pair that I had stated in the initial semantic, uh, sorry, initial topic could be related. It's just very counterintuitive. You just see what I mean? I don't, I don't exactly understand. So, it's it's even there in the they kind of stated on page two paragraph number um uh, believe the second one second last one where they say uh, despite their lack of semantic signif significance they still collect uh, significant attention scores for all contextual tokens so that's what they empirically prove but it's it's not intuitively sinking in if you know what i mean Hmm. I see what you're saying. Like, why? Why would they? Why? Why are attention sinks created at all? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, I don't think that they they give an explanation, which I think is a um, a good explanation. But it's no. There's no way of proving it uh, completely. Mm -hmm. But the I think the the idea is as it says here. Uh, thus, even when the current query does not have a strong match in any previous tokens, the model still needs to allocate these unneeded attention values somewhere. So it sums it up to one. Mm -hmm. So it's basically uh, so. Okay, this is my opinion on it. But in the later layers of a transformer, either very small differences in the the current embed in the current representation are required to like there's only very small differences being made in the representation being calculated or they there should they there they don't want any attention and attention to have any impact on that yeah the the representation and so attention sinks are created it's basically like so it's basically s s saying that it, it could be an interesting uh per, um experiment to see if you like took out the attention layer from like the first after the, the the first five or six layers of these transformers whether they would still perform as well because that's kind of what this is suggesting that the attention there isn't that at, that important but it could be like i said it's either that it's not important or that these attention blocks in the later layers are just being used to calculate like very small differences in the representation um, which could make a, make sense to me as well, just because we've shown that like larger language models perform better. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's more just that that uh, these attention sinks are required or useful because of the fact that we don't like we don't perform like uh, the 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 attention that's being performed. The attention operation isn't as important for for the the later layers. But if we if we use window attention and the models learn to use the first couple of to tokens as the attention sinks for ignoring the attention layer, then it kind of like the model the perf the performance is much worse because those attention sinks are no longer there. Mm, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah.
it, it could be like I, I really like the explanation that you gave that um though it seem counterintuitive that yet yeah, the when you describe the the 2d dimensional example mm -hmm. um the theta as as it gets larger and larger you you essentially having two attention vectors that are not correlated but then you said that's on a lower dimension these transformers have uh, these uh, embeddings on a very large uh, dimensionality so it could be that there in that dimension perhaps there is a correlation between your initial tokens and your uh, the ones that are very uh, instantaneous as in the, the ones you're uh, uh, close to your text generation it could that could be one example based on how you interpreted it yeah, it's that the attention sinks are cl close in angle to, or at least an angle, no, an angle, we'll say, in um, to all of the tokens after them. Possibly, yeah. Oh, no, on it, because it's highly dimensional, yeah, it could be. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's a very interesting paper. This is... Yeah, based on empirical findings, uh, but finding kind of like a very important relationship in, in LLMs. Absolutely. A cheers, Pete. Well, if there's um, no more questions, then I will stop recording. Oh, wait, is there another question? Yeah, I'll pop in. I think I, I wonder to what extent it, where, where you've got that initial um, attention between those initial tokens in that very high dimensional space, to what extent is it that they're actually close to each other? Or is it that the softmax is just pushing everything else to zero because they're much further away? Mm. If that makes sense, because yeah. if, if you've got a bunch of really dissimilar things, even if you know they're orthogonal, they're going to do way better than the stuff at minus one in your two D example, and will get pushed up in the softmax there, won't they? Yeah, that's true. Hmm. So I, I wonder if if there's another way to map those scores onto a probability distribution, and and I just think it'd be interesting to see. I mean, obviously it works because they've shown it has. Um, and it's really interesting, yeah, but I guess that's kind of a more fundamental thing to the actual structure of the model. Yeah. So the thing that Softmax does is that it um, it makes sure like every single value is positive or non-negative. Yeah. Let's say. Well, yeah. So yeah, yeah. everything's gone negative and sums to one. And yeah. And well, but also that you take all of the like the X's that are input to Softmax, like the logits, and you, you, they're exponential, like the their their that magnitude is exponentially increased because you're using them as an exponent mm -hmm. or decreased. Um, so it kind of like stretches everything. So you could use another method, like just taking the absolute value, but that wouldn't that wouldn't um, s stretch everything as much. So I don't think that that would be make much of a difference, but there's probably ways that you could make a big difference, like you said, by try choosing a different operation to calculate the attention weights. Yeah, I mean, because there's the they talk about the um, softmax plus one or something, was it? Um, mm -hmm. And I I, did, I think it would have been interesting to see a bit more on that. But I guess that's really all from me. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry I can't find the results for that. I do. I feel like I remember seeing them somewhere, but I just in the paper I meant because um, it was quite brief. Mm. True. Yeah, but particularly given how the attention sinks can be, you know, basically empty, they don't have to have any when they replace it with the new line. Yeah, it doesn't have to be yeah. that. So we'll we'll have to see what uh, this. I think this will be like a test of time paper in terms of seeing if it gets used a lot. The good thing is that the code for it is out there and it's really easy to use in terms of uh, it's like a Python package you install and it uses it it has the same structure as like the underlying hugging face transformer models that it supports. So if you guys want to use it, it's out there and um, we'll have to see how it uh, how it goes. Cool. Okay. Yeah.